great to think that uh, all your ancestors have done it all over the years, you know. As far as the fishing's gone in a hole, I think it's got to pack up anyway. They're wanting you finished, aren't they? It's quite a dangerous job, you know, and it's hard work. And, and apart from the cost, and <laughs> you're not going to do all that and not being able to take a salmon or, or two or three salmon, you know. As I say, we've been fishing here for a thousand years. And somebody that knows nothing at all about fishing wants to take it off with. It'll not come back again. They'll never allow it to start off again if they stop it. It's the last tide of the season. It might be the last tide ever. I think it's a right for the for the people of Arnon, a historic right. And we know that we're not causing the damage to the fishing stocks. But we're just a small man in, in a big game and we seem to be getting caught up in it all. A half net is a wooden frame, such as this, 16 feet long, with end sticks and a mid stick, onto which a net is attached. And that can be carried out onto the sands on the solway and held in place in the water to catch a fish. And half nets have been operating in this part of the country since at least Viking times. You can fish with rod and line in approximately 100 rivers in Scotland. And the skills that you use in one river is the same as in another river. But you only find half netting on a very small geographical area on the inner solway. And those skills are specialised skills that are learned from generation to generation. It's a way of life. It's a traditional way of life. And it's been endangered. Well, this is the earliest version we have of the uh, Borough Charter of Annan. Um, it's, this particular document is dated 1783, although the charter, if I turn back here, you can see that it's a probative registered charter by James VI in favour of the Borough of Annan, and it actually dates from 1612. The earliest charter we know of dates from somewhere around about 1340. And it mm -hmm. could even have been as early as Robert the Bruce's time. He died in 1329. Uh, and that's the first charter we know of. Uh, and what this charter does is say what rights the king is granting to the borough. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we look up here, you can see, first of all, it says, in unum liberum burgum regali, uh, in uh, each free uh, royal borough with uh, omnibus terrace, etc., etc. That's all the lands, and so on and so on. Uh, and then you get at the end of that, and piscationibus. That's the fishings. And then it tells you about the fishings themselves. So, uh, with salmonum piscationi, with the salmon fishings and other fishings, half nets, harfist. That's Scots actually. Mm -hmm. And it says that twice. We don't know mm -hmm. why. I think it's a mistake, possibly. So this was the later charter, so presumably all the previous charters also referred to the fishings, which showed you how important it was, even way back then. Well, the 1539 charter certainly referred to the fishings. It just didn't go into the bit of detail that we've got in this, in this charter, but oh, absolutely they'd be important, and I'd be very surprised if they weren't in the very first charter from the 14th century. Unfortunately, we don't know what that said, because in nearly all the boroughs, where there was fishing, it was mentioned as part of the rights of the borough because it was very important mm. to them, income-wise mm. and for the livelihood of the folk mm. who lived there. Mm -hmm. Do you know how old or when the Arran Common Good Fund actually originated? Well, because, uh, the reason I ask that is because we know that the major contributor to the Arran Common Good Fund was income from the fishings. Yes. But I'm not. I'm personally not quite sure how far back that goes. Common good was instituted, even if it wasn't stated specifically, when the borough was instituted. Right. So that's how far back common good goes. It was part of the rights of the borough held under the king. Graham, you'll, you'll be familiar with the unwinding of the marches, and we we ride a, a distinct boundary um, every year. And have done so for hundreds of years. 
Does the, the, the old archive actually delineate where that boundary is? Yes, it does, and that, that was very important. You get all the, the northerly end, the north end of the borough, places mm -hmm. like Warmanby mentioned mm -hmm. in here, and then it comes down to the Solway where the fishings were, and it mentions various features down there, uh, including the altar stain, which is still well mm -hmm. known today, yep. uh, and there it is, Adlier altar stain, infra aquam de Solway in the waters of Solway. The, the altar stone is still highly symbolic. Lots of the fishermen have engraved the the names well, of it, they? and that, can, that goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and uh, well, there's one of the reasons that it yeah. was a boundary marker as well. Yeah. I mean, it marks the easterly boundary of our territory, but where the channel actually moves north above the altar stone, then what happens is both the Scottish side and the English side of the channel become Annan property. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The west side of Annan Net Fishery starts at the River Mouth and runs south to the middle of the main channel at low tide. This whole area we tend to talk about as Annan Rig or the Sand Rig. The Stenner runs from the river mouth to the old snab snake net. This is the traditional place to fish the late flood around 10 hours ebb, though currently it's sanded up and can't be fished. Out towards the channel is the Inbai. We fish the early flood here but you've got to watch that the tide doesn't cut you off by running up the Stena. Annan West, Mid and East Backs are named after the lines of poke nets that once stood on the Annan Rig. They're not there anymore, but we still use their names to describe where we're fishing at the channel. Another good area for the ebb and early flood is where the channel scours out around the foundations of the old railway viaduct. You can also sometimes find a place to fish the early ebb in Seafield Hole. Once you're east of the old bridge, that's what we call the Gauke, named after Gaukesque Rig, and beside the shore is the remains of Seafield Stake Net. Back out towards the channel, we can fish the ebb and early flood on the Gauke West, Mid and Daughter Backs, also named after the position of the old poke nets. At the far end of that area is the Altar Stone, a glacial boulder that marks the edge of Annan Ground. From there, the boundary runs south to the middle of the channel and north to the shore at Muirbet Burn, just east of Battle Hill. The remains of Clatty Stake Net are just a little further west. Between there and Sea Field, there's the lead. When it's deep, it can be fished around four hours ebb and later we can do the flood here after coming off the main channel. Now that the stake and poke nets have gone, in theory, you could fish with your half net anywhere inside the licensed area. Good fishing areas change with each tide as the sand builds up or washes away. But in general, we're always looking for features that guide the fish into the net. Pull-ons, breasts, hems, turning places or deep pools which hold fish. Obviously there's certain places in the water there at certain times of the tide that it fishes best. You have to have a fair system. We've got a set of rules that I believe were, were drafted in the 50s. George Chalmers was involved in the drafting of these. So to give everybody a fair chance, uh, they cast the males. And that's where the, the, each person throws their mail on the sand in a circle. There's, uh, one person turns his back and the rest pick a male to stand at. There's one male left and that is the chap that's kicking them out, that gets that one. Right. He comes back again and kicks one of the males out. Run with a bit of string. And that starts off as number one. After number one, he miss one, and then he take the next one as number two. Then he miss one, and the next one is number three. Two, three, four. And it goes on until all the males have been Picked. and then that's your position for standing in the water. Number one sets it, he goes in as shallow as he wants or as deep as he wants and then after that the rest follow suit the number. Well it's a pity. I've drawn with 32 men 
when you look to that soil and you see the, the tide drawing up and the sand there just gradually being covered. Well, I could look, look at the window and see oh, there's two or three men fishing, you know. Well, I've drawn with 32 men and now there's nobody. Between the money that was spent for half net licenses and pulp net licenses, and then there was the top net fishing stew, you see. I mean, about three or, three or four thousand pounds they were getting off the, the fishings. So it was really important for the town. It's a nice day, so I thought I'd come down and take a few photographs for posterity, record the happen, just in case it dies out. I've been fishing for nearly, nearly 48 years. And when I started, some, some, some men actually did it for a living. And then it was because of environmental reasons and all sorts of other factors, wild fish started to decline in numbers. And more and more regulations came in for conservation. And the numbers of fishermen have dropped constantly since. So now it's just a hobby. It's a totally different way. It used to be that people did it as a living. But now, it's a hobby or a sport, a pastime. The only thing about this is it's only, you know, you get June, July and August, one week in September, and that's it, done. You couldn't make a living out here. There's no way you could make a living. No half net, that's for sure. Come on, let's have a big one. Here they are, John, you watching? This is what we're looking for. That's the one I've been waiting for. <sighs> there was no mistake in that, and I knew exactly what it was. It's not a matter of killing fish, it's a matter of practising uh, an ancient art, an ancient tradition. I think we should be, I should be able to exploit the fish. I think it's wrong that we, sh we shouldn't be allowed to take a, a certain, certain few salmon for ourselves to eat. It's a tradition, it's a heritable tradition, it's Asian, and we've got to practise it. The same with the steak nets and the pork nets. When the expertise in putting steak nets in and pork nets in and the interest once that goes, they never come back, and it'd be a really sorry, sad sight. Well, I'm, I'm Tom Rogers, and I've half netted for 50 years. Started half netting when I was 15, and I've done it up until 10 years ago. I'm 83 now. My auntie used to knit nets. And it was her that taught me to start with. This is all you need, actually. Needles. Uh, that's a kyle for different size of mesh. Within the next couple of years, there won't be any half nets. That's my, only my opinion. I don't think there will be. People won't go half netting, and, and it's quite a dangerous job, you know, and it's hard work. And, and apart from the cost, and you're not going to do all that and not being able to take a salmon or, or two or three salmon, you know. Because what, what you catch, it's only a drop in the bucket. You're standing on the edge of the solway with a half net, which is about 16 foot long, and you can the, the tide goes away across as far as Eden. <laughs> so there's lots of space for fish to get by here, and it's not as if you were going to catch everything that comes up the river, you know. Smell the red pine. I just have always seen where they use, used red pine. But it must be uh, 25, 26 years since I made my last half long. So it's just, just things start to come back to the earth as you start to work away. 
you get so far on and say, oh, how did I do that? And then as soon as you start doing it, then you say, oh, I remember how I've done it now. My cousin, Alan Warwick's a half netter. He's, what he's, he's been doing, because he's been taking some of the, the young boys of the, the relations and that down and giving them a shot of the half net just to say they've had a shot of a half net before, before it stops really. So that's him. It's a shame like. Uh, tap the mid sticks in and the end sticks in. And that's it. That's a half been done. Well, obviously, there is going to be a problem with knowledge. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure the, the age of the youngest half now, probably 34, 35, there's nobody new coming through, but I brought my son down this year, he's, he's 17, I thought I'd fetch him down, give him a bit of a taster and that, but he wasn't keen. A lot of people are under the disillusion that there's fish caught every tide, sometimes you'll go weeks and there's no fish, so there's a lot of patience involved in half netting. I hope that we can go forward fishing one salmon a month and two trout per tide because I think that's sustainable. You would need that to keep guys fishing. One salmon a month for June, July and August. Surely it's got to be sustainable. It's a reward for your efforts and I'd, I honestly don't think that, that we are making that big an impact on the fishing stocks. The problem's elsewhere. I mean, fish, half net has been going on for a thousand years now. Our numbers have been cut down from 46 to 30. I think we'd probably be sitting about 15 to 16 Annan men and local men fishing. It's probably one of the most environmentally friendly forms of fishing that you could get because the net's never unattended. The man is always with it. So whatever fish comes into the net, if you're going to kill it, it's got to be killed quickly before it escapes. And if it's going to be released, it can be released in seconds. It doesn't matter whether it's a salmon or a flounder or whatever. It's not like on the river where you hook a fish, then you've got to play it to tire it out. And then when you've tired it out, you pull it into the side. You've got to get the hook back out. You're handling that fish. Some, some anglers may wait or take a photograph and then you've got to place it back in the, in the water and give it time to recover. Catch and release with a half net is a very, very quick and simple method. You feel the, the, the bump of the fish on your net, you reach for the, for the net, pull in all your meshes and then simply slide the fish over the top of your beam. It's a matter that takes a few seconds. mortality on the river with angling. The Scottish Government reckon it's around 10%. I'd have to say that with half netting the mortality is zero or as close to zero as it could ever be. But whilst anglers are catching and releasing they're actually killing one in every ten fish that they hook. You've got to watch what you're doing. It is a bit silly just to come by yourself, but there's less and less people coming, so... 
in this particular part of the solway you get a lot of flow holes you usually get them a lot worse when the, the tides come to what they call breaking the tides when they get to the height and then they start dropping back but they're hidden in a lot of places so you could walk into one very easily you could be stepping off the edge of the sand where it's maybe only six to eight inches deep and it could go over to two feet, three feet, four feet. I went into the deep hole too quick. I put my half net down but before it touched the sand I knew it was running too hard. So I picked it up and I'm, as I'm picking that net up the tide's pushing me back and pushing me back, pushing me back and I stepped into a flow hole. I was shot back that shot back in that tide at an unbelievable rate. I lay on my back, I held onto the beam, wouldn't let go of the beam, and I floated, I used my hand and I, and I like back crawled out of, the, out of the channel. I got down about 50 yards uh, down the channel. But that was a, a lesson that I never forgot. I will always uh, check behind me. So it's just a case of push the beam at the end and feel your way along the sand nice and gently. Just make sure there's no big holes or anything. Because if you do step in a hole with this amount of water coming through, you're away. And I had a bit of feel round in a kind of circle and round behind me here. Because if I've got to jump back, I want to make sure there's nothing in there as well that I'm going to just disappear into. This can change every tide. I mean, it moves thousands of tons of sand a tide. You just don't know what's underneath you, so it's always best to have a bit poke about it and make sure you're safe enough. Oh, you've just got to know what you're doing and you've got to respect the place. You've got to respect it. You've got to have a fair idea what you're doing and you've got to learn that over a long, 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 long period of time. Everybody that's fishing now from Annan is genuinely a fisherman. They love it. Everybody that goes out there love it. The few folk that are still coming yet, they enjoy it. And uh, if they stopped it well, and it'd be like, it's like your nets, you're never going to see it again. It'll not come back again. They'll never allow it to, to start off again if they stop it. It'd be a disaster if they stopped it. It really would. For the last three seasons, we've had special dispensation from the Scottish Government and Marine Scotland to catch three salmon per man over the season. Those fish have been taken for scientific study. A scientific officer from the river board comes down, takes samples, and then the carcass could be taken away by the fishermen for consumption. So that's operated for the last three years, but it's now come to an end. It's great to think that uh, all your ancestors have done it all over the years, you know. As far as the fishing's gone in a hole, I think it's got a Pack up anyway. They're what you finished, aren't they? Talking about one summer next year. It's good that to anybody. Ah, uh, it'll be me finished, I think. For the year, maybe finished all together. <laughs> it's the last tide of the season. It might be the last tide ever depending on what the Scottish Government decide if we have any fish next year or not. It's unique. It's a tradition that's been there since the Vikings obviously made their way up the Solway and decided to hang a net off, off an oar. We're just custodians, we're just carrying on a tradition for future generations and hopefully someone will carry on fishing if we're allowed.